During World War II, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, many Japanese-American families faced barriers because of their race. One such story is of Norman Manita and his family that shows us how they overcame these barriers. Norman Manita was born on November 12, 1931 in San Jose, California. He came from a Japanese-American family of seven, his three sisters, his brother, Norman, and their parents. Norman's father had come to the United States at the age of 14 to visit his uncle living in San Francisco. Realizing the opportunities America gave, Norman's father decided to settle in San Jose with Norman's mother. As a kid, Norman struggled with reading and writing in school. His parents never took him to a doctor to confirm he had dyslexia, but he knew he had it. Because of this, he had to work extra hard in school. Over the years, Norman's father became friends with San Jose officials. Everything was great for everyone, and they didn't face any barriers until the event at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. When the church let out, Norman and his parents crossed the street to their home shortly after noon on December 7th. Some neighbors were waiting outside for them. That's when they heard the news that Japan had bombed the United States Naval Base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and severely damaged the Pacific Fleet's ships and planes. Norman's father immediately turned on the radio to hear the devastating news updates, and he kept it on throughout the day. Japanese Americans were dismayed that Japan would do something so terrible and wondered what it meant for them. They hoped no one would think that they had anything to do with the attack, for they were only loyal to the American flag. Norman's father told his family to be worried and not to forget the situation entirely because the relations between the United States and Japan had been training for a long time. Norman hadn't paid any attention to the two countries' relations because he was not interested, but he knew from everyone's worried voices that something significant had just happened. Norman's family soon found out that Mr. Hirano, their neighbor, was handcuffed and taken away by some U.S. officials. Norman's father later found out that the FBI agents were picking up Japanese people who were community leaders or who might be collaborating to invade the United States. President Franklin Roosevelt declared war on Japan. Japan declared war on the United States. The United States joined allies with Great Britain and France and then declared war on Germany. The U.S. government had no idea what they had gotten themselves into. They were imprisoning their own citizens because of where they were from and they were taking away freedoms from Americans just because they had Japanese ancestry. Norman got scared that his father would be the next to get taken away. That evening, Norman's father packed his suitcase with his belongings just in case the FBI came to take him away. No FBI agent came to the Minita house in the following days, which was a relief. Norman thought the FBI probably left his father alone because he had so many influential American friends. For Americans of Japanese descent, it was the beginning of a nightmare. Overnight, Japan became a despised enemy. People began to ask questions like, could Japanese Americans living along the West Coast be trusted? Were they aiding from the inside? This suspicion and guilt distressed Norman. Norman never thought that being a Japanese American was something negative. These early days after Pearl Harbor were the hardest for Japanese Americans. A lot changed in just two weeks. In January of 1942, the Japanese won victory after victory in the South Pacific, sinking American ships and downing aircrafts. The label Jap had become a hateful racial slur used to describe both the enemy and Japanese Americans. At school, Norman started to hear kids call him, hey Jap, or yelled, saying, you bomb Pearl Harbor. Those words hurt him deeply. He'd always grin like he thought they were joking, but inside he burned with shame. Life grew harder and harder every day. The government imposed travel restrictions and the police permission was required for trips longer than five miles. The government searched Japanese American homes for any information or signs that could suggest that they were helping the Japanese. This showed that the government broke the citizens' trust to show power. Because of this, Norman's parents had to pack away Japanese treasures that they possessed. Suddenly, President Roosevelt ordered the Japanese Americans who lived along the coast to be taken away to an internment camp. Norman's family only got two days of notice. The day before the evacuation, two FBI agents came to Norman's house for a final check of their belongings for cameras, flashlights, or radios, which were considered illegal to carry. Norman's family was assigned a family number, and the number was tagged on their belongings. Norman realized that they were going to leave their homeland and everything they knew. Norman had no idea where he was going on the train, but he overheard that they were to arrive at a horse track of Santa Anita. They were to stay here until the permanent internment camps were built. When they reached the internment camp, they were surprised. They were told to stuff their mattresses with straw. Along the racefield parking lot, the 500 barracks and horse stables were converted, in, converted into housing. U.S. soldiers stood atop a tower, armed, watching for any dangerous activity. At mealtimes, Norman and his family had to wait in line for food. Norman's family didn't like the food because most of it was canned, but no one complained because they knew that was all they would get. 
After settling inside their barracks, they took a walk around Santa Anita where they hoped to run into some friends. Later, Roman ran into his best friend and was relieved because he knew someone at the camp other than his family. Norman could not have guessed that their whole family could fit in one room. Back at home, Norman and his brother shared a room slightly larger than the one where his whole family stayed in now. Everyone had to hand wash everything. There were 150 showers for 8,000 people, so the lines were really long. Just after Norman's 11th birthday, he learned that they were going to be transferred to the Heart Mountain Internment Camp in Wyoming. The Heart Mountain Internment Camp was much bigger and had a baseball team. Norman and his family had no warm clothes, so they ordered them from the camp catalog. People in the internment camps were able to subscribe to the camp newspaper, which had news about camp and also the war. This helped Norman's family feel dis less disconnected from the rest of the world. Heart Mountain had two elementary schools. Norman was sent to school right away by his parents. Norman's new teacher, Mrs. Folkar, realized Norman's struggle in reading and writing. Mrs. Folkar created fun reading and writing strategies to help Norman improve. Soon, Norman started liking school and looked forward to it every day. Soon, Norman's father found a good teaching job in the army. Unfortunately, Norman and his family could not go with him. They exchanged their goodbyes and Norman's father was gone. After a year of living in Heart Mountain, Norman and his mother were permitted to leave Heart Mountain and live with his dad. Norman was very surprised when the trip went smoothly as he expected other people to discriminate against them because they were Japanese. As the train came to a stop, Norman saw his father waving at them with a smile. Norman and his mother returned to a normal life. Norman longed for the day when he and his family could return to San Jose to his house. Within a few weeks, luck had changed drastically in the war. On April 12, 1945, Harry Truman became the President of the United States following the sudden death of Franklin Roosevelt. Less than three weeks later, on April 30th, Hitler committed suicide, which put an end to World War II around the world. The United States had dropped two atomic bombs in Japan, causing lots of damage, which forced the Japanese to surrender. Now that the war was over, the Manitas were able to return to their home in San Jose. Norman didn't let his dyslexia be a barrier to achieving his goals. He completed high school and eventually graduated from UC Berkeley with a major in business administration. During World War II, after the Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, the U.S. government broke the trust barrier with American citizens by imprisoning Americans in internment camps based solely on their ethnicity. This affected numerous Japanese Americans on the mainland, resulting in getting all freedoms taken away from them. In spite of barriers and hardships in his early life, Norman used his experiences to lead a very accomplished life in the service of his country, the United States. Norman's story has impacted many people around the world, including the U.S. government, who made him the first Asian American cabinet member. He also founded the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, where politicians even today discuss Asian, Asian and Pacific problems and come up with solutions to overcome them. Norman Manita has had a long and fulfilling career of 39 years in politics. He held several positions as councilman, mayor of San Jose, secretary of commerce, and secretary of transportation before he retired in 2006. He was in the House of Representatives from 1975 to 1995. Norman was Secretary of Transportation at the time of the 9-11 tax in 2001. As soon as he heard of the two planes crashing into the World Trade Center, he headed to the White House where he heard of the third plane crash into the Pentagon. Norman and his team didn't know anything about what was going on at the time except that there were 7 to 10 unaccounted planes in the American sky. Norman ordered all 4,638 planes to be grounded right away without pilot discretion so that his team had a better chance to assess the situation. This was a bold decision he made for the greater good. In an interview with Ronald Sarazen in September 2006, Norman mentions what he wants to be remembered as. How would you like to be remembered? Well, again, it's, uh, <clears throat> I guess, the whole issue of being a good listener. Uh, listening to all the kinds of points of view that you have coming at you. Uh, but by the same token, none of us can do things to satisfy everybody. So you have to find out what is it that's going to be the best for the greater good. And uh, so I, over the years, whether it was as a member of the city council, mayor, a member of Congress, or executive branch, always trying to figure out where is that path that uh, gives you uh, the greater good?